May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So as many of you know, uh, my mother died um, a week ago yesterday. And I am sad about it. I'm not crushed. She was 92 and ready, and it was time. I am very appreciative of the outpouring of concern and care and love that you all have uh, uh, extended to me and my family. So I've been thinking her, uh, about her a little bit this week. <laughs> the first time my mother met my dad, she was at a, a party at her mother's house. And she was kind of keeping her eyes peeled for somebody to spend her time with, some fellow that she might marry or, or at least uh, go on a date with or something like that. And she took one look at my dad and she says, oh, damn, it's, he's too short. And then she went, she went to Germany and she worked for a, govern or, a government organization called the OSI, which eventually became the CIA leading me to conclude that she was obviously a spy there in the mid-50s in Germany, and she knew French and knew a little bit of German, you know, with the high heels and the lipstick and all that bit. She said to me, of course, she denied it. Naturally, she would. She said, I was just a secretary. I wasn't a spy. I said, what's the difference? They both know everything that's going on in the organization, and if you can persuade them properly, they will tell you. Hmm. Anyway, while she was in Germany, my dad sent her a letter, the first of several, in which he said, um, it must be a great adventure to be working in Europe and to see all the sights. Um, but also, I know you may be a little homesick being there all on your own. And so I'm going to send a few letters to you every once in a while with news from back home here in Virginia. And my mom showed this letter to a friend of hers who was another secretary at uh, OSI. She was a Jewish woman from New York. She reads this letter and she said, I would marry that man, she says. And um, eventually, my mother did. They were married for 50 years. Drove each other absolutely crazy and loved each other deeply. Jesus says in our gospel lesson for today, I came that they may have life abundantly. So one time my mother was driving her little sports car. She had a little TR3. And she was driving through the German Alps. She stops her car by the side of the road, and there's this alpine lake way down there below. And, and the grass of the pasture was blazing green, just shining green in the sunlight way up in the mountains there. And she looked down from uh, where she was by the side of the road, and in the lake there was uh, a boy and his father, and they were swimming together. And she watched the boy and his father swim for a while, and then after a while, the boy got out of the lake and he picked up from the grass a crutch. And he brought the crutch to his father and his father took the crutch and used it to stand up because he only had one leg. And my mother said to me much later, she said, that was when I realized that the German soldiers who fought in the Second World War were human beings too. I came so that they may have life abundantly, says Jesus. Now, I need to say a few things about this text. Um, particularly, uh, I want to make sure we understand to whom Jesus is speaking. Because this particular passage... Mm, can push us in the direction 
a little bit too far, I think, if we take it out of its context, out of the story from which it comes. It can push us too far. Jesus says, I am the gate through which you get to the sheep. So congratulations, everybody. We've all come through the gate. Welcome to the Christian club. Um, uh, we are here, and everything is great, and we are righteous, and it's too bad those people over there are all thieves and bandits, right? Okay. Before we go too far in that direction, let's remember that Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders of his day and to a man who had been born blind, and Jesus gives him the gift of his sight on the Sabbath, when you're not supposed to be doing stuff like that. Okay? So here's how the story goes. Jesus is an, and his disciples are walking along, they, and they see this man who was born blind, and Jesus' disciples ask him, they say, Who sinned, Lord, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Because clearly, somebody's Somebody had to have sinned for this to have happened. It has to be somebody's fault, either his fault or maybe his parents' fault. It has to be somebody's fault because if it's not his fault or his parents' fault, then there's chaos in the world. Things that happen that make no sense, right? Things that aren't fair. And if there are things that happen in the world that make no sense, if there's chaos in the world that has, doesn't seem to have any reason, then those things might happen to me. And I want to feel like I can be smart enough and righteous enough and, and, and down to earth enough that I don't ever have any of those horrible things happen to me. So it's got to be his fault. It's got to be somebody's fault. Of course, this way of thinking is based on the assumption that God does not exist, right? Because God is beyond any chaos. There is a presence and a power and a love in this world that is more profound than any senseless thing that might happen. So Jesus says, neither he nor his parents sinned. And then Jesus goes and he heals the man's eyes so he can see. This is how we respond to horrible things that happen to other people in the world. We are not quite so concerned with whose fault it might be. We are concerned with responsibility and making things an even keel. But our main concern is to be in connection and relationship to be a part of God's healing and God's life in this world. That's what Jesus did. That's what we do. Of course, Jesus did it on the Sabbath. Cringe. Major reshuffling of, uh, an under, of our understanding of this law of God, that you are supposed to take a rest every once in a while. You are supposed to take a rest to give room for God's presence in your life. This is a law. It is a real law. It is not changed, but Jesus has reshuffled our understanding of that law so that the wholeness and healing of this man who could not sin takes precedence. There is room within the law for his healing and wholeness. That's a kind of a hard thing. And the religious leaders of Jesus' day don't like it. So they condemn Jesus and they throw this man out. Okay? This man who before had no hope of belonging, no hope of being a part, of the community, no hope of being able to make a contribution to the community, but rather uh, was condemned to sit on the edge of town, on the edge of the road, begging for his whole life. Now he has a chance to be a part of the community. He has a chance to be a part of, of the family and to make a contribution to the community, and the religious leaders have thrown him out. And now this is when Jesus says, I am the gate. Not your interpretation of the rules. I am the gate. Not whether you can see or not. I am the gate into this community. 
So if the rules have to be understood and shifted a little bit so that you can be whole and healthy, you still belong here. If you can't see right, you still belong here. If horrible things have happened to you, and it's not your fault, you belong in this community. If nothing horrible has ever happened to you in your whole life, you still belong in this community. If horrible things have happened to you, and it's your own blinking fault, you are still a part of this community because I am the gate, not you. I am the gate, says Jesus. If you are heterosexual or homosexual or transsexual or gender fluid or you're not really sure, you belong in this family. You are a part of this community. If you are rich, you belong. If you are poor, you are belong. If you are white, you belong. If you are black, you belong. If you're Asian, you belong. If you're Hispanic, you belong. If you're from an indigenous nation, you belong. If you have more than one of these powerful, holy, and beautiful heritages in your background, you belong in this community because I am the gate. If you have a mental condition, that disturbs your soul, you are still a part of this community. You are mine. I came that they all might have life abundantly. For God so loved the world the world. So when I went to see my mom three weeks ago, um, she really couldn't see much of anything. And she couldn't think really well either. She did, she did know me and she knew my sisters, but she didn't no much else. She did take my fingers in her hands, the sort of shaky hands, and she drew them up to her lips. Just a little kiss. And we held hands for a long, long time. I suppose we're holding hands still. You know, because she's with God, and God is with me, and Jesus still brings life abundant to her, and to me, and to you, and to everyone you love, to the whole world. Thanks be to God.